The other <coughs> factor is whether uh, we will somehow forget the technological advances that as a society we have made this last, say, 25 years. And I just isn't going to happen. So I think that as soon as the, uh, the virus is, is seen to be coming under control, and there is some doubt about it at the moment, um, I would think that we're going to see uh, the market um, turning up pretty sharply. I, that's my guess, but I don't know that. But for what it's worth, uh, which I think is worth nothing, I mentioned to you yesterday, uh, I was short of FTSE. Well, I bought it back at 17, not 70, at six, uh, 6186, uh, where it stands right now, uh, this, uh, earlier this afternoon. And for, I think that's enough for the time being. That's why I bought it back. Uh, but it's a... Uh, I, I'm ready to go short again of FTSE in, on quite a heavy scale. But I'm not, not just at the moment. Have I made myself clear? I don't know. <laughs> um, would you agree, Simon, with the, with the general consensus that if, if things do um, get worse with the virus, if we, go, if we have to go back into lockdown mm. um, and it takes much longer than people you know, mm. might anticipate for a, vi uh, sorry, a, a vaccine to be developed and things like that, yeah. Um, do we do we agree with the sort of the the, the principle of the the um, the Federal Reserve just coming in the, the so-called um, Fed put? Um, do we do we do we agree with that? You know the the idea that the Fed will backstop markets no matter what, and in the sense that you know that's that's kind of um, you know it's it's drawing a line under under the market at the moment. What do you think? Well, the fact is, the Fed has not got an infinite amount of money. That ghastly fellow Trump seems to behave as if it, there is an infinite amount of money, and there isn't. Don't forget that uh, between April and June, he borrowed $3 trillion, or about 30% of gross national product in America, and I'm sure he spent it by now. Uh, if he starts to go raising another three, tr three trillion, which is quite possible, then we're going to have some real excitement. That's for sure. And and how does this all play into the, the you know the situation with inflation? Because a lot of commentators now are talking about much higher levels of inflation in future, aren't they? Yes, but uh, that's the funny thing. There seems to be little or no effect upon prices so far, but I can't believe that that will continue to be the case. The fact is that the supply of goods and services in relation to the supply of money is sharply shrunk. And therefore, the only question is the speed with which money changes hands, the velocity of money. Well, I don't think there's any reason to expect that to change. So therefore, I'm inclined to think uh, prices in general will have to rise in America. Remember, the, it is the American dollar we're talking about here when we're setting out the bull case for gold. Sterling really doesn't matter at all. It's neither here nor there. And, and speaking of the, uh, the US dollar, we've got a question from, from Philip. Um, What's Evil's opinion on some form of global monetary reset? I don't see how it's possible that in 10 years, the US dollar will still be the world's reserve currency, especially given the astronomical budget deficits that are now... <laughs> well, uh, well I, he, he's not... Really, Philip is not sufficiently clear as to what currency will supplant uh, the dollar. And... <laughs> Well, is it, well, is it the renminbi they have in, in China? I don't know. I can never, it's the yuan. I don't know what it is. But I can't see the Chinese economy eclipsing the Americans um, on a per capita basis. That's not going to happen for a very, very long time. Uh, therefore, the question is, will they, as an economy in aggregate, supplant the Americans? Well, I think even that is some way off. 
So it, again, it comes back to the conduct of the dollar. And I hear, I think here that uh, uh, friend Trump uh, has wisely decided to spend a lot of money to keep people employed in the States. But I don't think he's anywhere near succeeding. So the fact is, I must imagine that you'll go on borrowing money on this heroic scale and uh, then eventually the realization of this completely unrepayable debt will lead to uh, inflation of one form or another. And as to when it starts and as to the scale, I don't know, but I can't think it'll be long deferred. And all this feeds into gold, doesn't it? So if we, if we, if we begin to lose faith in fiat currencies, um, we look to gold. Um, yeah. And you, you told me yesterday that, that you expect to make hundreds of thousands, if not a million plus yeah. on, on gold, you know, in, in the short term. So <laughs> yeah. how, um, how are you setting yourself up then at the moment to, to benefit from higher gold prices? Well, I'm long of physical gold. And I've uh, got quite a few gold shares in one form or another. So we'll just have to wait and see. Uh, I may add, I was speaking to a Frenchman earlier today who says that he takes gold very seriously. I said, what do you mean by that? He said, well, I keep my gold uh, in a strong room at my bank in Paris. I said, isn't that a very expensive thing to do? And, he said, well, you either take investing in gold seriously or you don't. And he reminded me that, of course, the argument for gold revolves around eclipsing bits of paper saying you've got gold. You've actually got the gold. <laughs> and I said, well, let's take it very seriously. He said, well, I've always been very serious. I'm a Frenchman. We take gold very seriously. So <laughs> I think the answer to that is that if you're really serious, um, you get the gold. Actually, if I may trip him up a bit, why would you keep the gold in the bank? All you've got is a strong room key under armed guard supervision. Whereas if you're taking, looking after your gold seriously, you'll dig a trench uh, 50 feet deep behind your mansion in uh, the depths of France. Uh, and uh, you will keep it down there in little tin boxes, I suppose. <laughs> I, I can't be bothered with that. If it were the case that I had the feeling that I was going to have to run from Europe, then I would, I suppose, consider having physical gold. But really, I'm not in that position, and I don't think there's any need to proceed on the basis that I'm going to be in that position either. So when we're talking about physical gold, we're talking about ETFs? Well, no, I think the cheapest way to do it is to uh, buy them through the spread bet right. uh, bookmakers. Uh, you see, they are in effect lending in sterling terms at 3% per annum uh, any amount of money you like uh, to buy gold. Of course, you have to trust that the spread bets better in question will remain solvent over the 18 months required for this exercise. But I'm certain that is by far and away the cheapest method of getting an exposure to gold for the average investor, that's for sure. And what about the gold mining companies? Because obviously they're a, they're a, a, they're a kind of a leverage play on the gold price in, in the yeah. right, aren't they, because of operational gearing? Yeah, absolutely. But uh, I, uh, I think on this occasion, instead of going for a particular mine, I, I would just say one has just shares in Golden Prospect. You know, the net asset value of Golden Prospect is now at least 62p per share. And I wouldn't mind betting that it'll be 64 or 65 pence tonight overnight when, when London reopens. And here we are buying Golden Prospect shares at 51p. I mean, really, that's, that's ridiculous. And, and you obviously, you're betting that the 
uh, price discount will narrow, uh, but it has to, it can't possibly continue where it is. And that being the case, I think, well, the average investor coming through inspiration, shall we say, Tim is excluded or you excluded, I can't remember the word advice, but <laughs> you're getting inspiration through Master Investor, the way to do it is to buy Golden Prospect shares. As far as I'm aware, there is no other fund available uh, in the UK uh, for any investor. So um, a lot of investors have been asking about um, price targets for gold. And I know, um, I think it was Goldman Sachs put out a um, $3,000 price target for gold yeah. What, what's your take? What, well, I, I agree with them. <laughs> I agree with them. It's not, I, I, I don't agree with them because I'm a bull or anything silly like that. I think this thing can skip through $2,000 without blinking. Because the fact is, there is vastly more paper money around the world uh, than there is gold. Vastly more. And so it wouldn't surprise me that once the frenzy steps in on gold, and we haven't had a frenzy yet, uh, we'll see a hundred, up a hundred dollars in a day without blinking. So I, you know, I think there's a very strong uh, bull case here, and if it gets up to two thousand dollars, I'm not selling because if it gets up to two thousand dollars, the fact is the market is starting to get a grip on what's going on and it'll be two and a half thousand dollars and if you get to two and a half thousand dollars three thousand dollars is not impossible because as i say there is vastly more paper money than there is gold so i could see it's gonna just switch that way what about silver simon because uh, silver's well absolutely uh i th there is it is sensible to uh, recognize that the long term relationship between gold and silver will hold. And so, if your fancy is silver, then um, silver it is. I may add that silver moves very quickly. Indeed, some of your listeners, maybe in your, our listeners, perhaps I should say, uh, may be interested to know that the Chinese refer to silver as the devil metal because it moves so quickly. Right. So that I think you'll get more bang for your money uh, with silver than you will with gold. I just do gold because I've always done gold. And I think, um, so I'm not switching from gold to silver or going into silver as well as gold. I just stay with gold. But I see no objection to going for silver at all. Okay, we're going to talk about some individual stocks and sticking with the gold theme. I've got a question from Hugh. Um, yeah. He's asking for an update on Orisur mining. <laughs> this is a cross I have to bear. It'll be on my <laughs> gravestone. Well, only I'm not going to have a gravestone because my instructions to my personal shopper is that when I snuff it, she's going to have me fried or whatever they do in, uh, in uh, whatever they do in crematoria. And then she's going to run the uh, ashes up to Newmarket Heath. And therefore, the need for a gravestone rather falls uh, to one side. And uh, so what was your question? I'm talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the question was... Um, um, can we have an update on Orisa? On Orisa? Oh, yes. <laughs> the cross I have to bear. Um, the fact is that, as you know, uh, Orisa eventually proved very disappointing in Uruguay because every time uh, it was thought the, the mine had got to the real continuing vein of gold, it would promptly peter out. And now the Uruguayan end has been closed down. And the, the entire hopes of Uruguay, uh, Orissa mining, is dependent upon uh, an, an undeveloped site in Colombia called ANZA, A-N-Z-A. -A. And uh, their partner here is Newmont. 
and Newmont have all the money in the world, so there's no chance of the project running out of cash. And Newmont um, have uh, recently disclosed very, very attractive gold veins adjacent to the Anza property. So I, if you like to speculate on what might happen uh, at Anza, and you like gold, then Orisa is a jolly good bet. But as to when it happens, I don't know. I've forgotten how many shares the family's got. Three million? Three million? I just can't remember. Um, another gold stock, um, Condor Gold. Um, can we right. have your thoughts on that one? Well, I'm not expert. Uh, as you know, the chairman is very sweet on Condor. Uh, but a, a friend of mine, uh, who is independent of the chairman, I, the chairman, as you know, is a director of Condor, uh, but uh, this friend of mine, um, he says the figures add up at uh, Condor, and uh, so one should buy Condor. But uh, personally, if I were just being dispassionate, I'd just buy shares in Golden Prospect, and I wouldn't mess about with, with Condor. Don't forget, the managers of Golden Prospect can buy uh, Condor if they feel like it. They've got, in effect, an infinite supply of money at one and a half percent over base available to them. So, I mean, if it's right to do it, they'll do it. So, uh, I wouldn't put anyone off buying Condor, far from it. Uh, we've got it in the family. I can't remember where, but we have got it. and. Uh, so I couldn't possibly argue against Condor. Why would I? The fact is, though, that there are various means whereby uh, avenues known to me, which I've already touched upon, are uh, perfectly capable of benefiting from the rise in the gold price without investing in Condor. Okay. Um, question from Shantha. Um, any news on Caribbean investment holdings? Ah. This so is a crack. Ashcroft is a big investor in, isn't it? Yeah, this is a cracking investment, and I don't know why people are so stupid that they can't see it. Quite simply, about six or seven weeks ago, Lord Ashcroft, and uh, uh, he's not a fool, that chap. Uh, he. Uh, he had a shell, a cash shell, quoted in the Bahamas. And I suppose people presumed that he would do something with that shell. But actually, he simply turned the cash in the shell over into to Caribbean at 38 pence a share. Now, the number of factors arise from that. The first is... He cannot think that Caribbean is in any sort of financial trouble because if he, if he were to think that, why on earth would he put in all this cash into Caribbean? And the answer to that is he doesn't think Caribbean's in trouble. So that's a very important point. And remember that the decision to go in, out of cash into new shares in Caribbean was made after considerable data was already available to him about the whether COVID-19 was bashing Caribbean. So I really don't think there's any troubles at Caribbean at all. The purpose of the fund is for him, in effect, to pick up sensible investments uh, in Belize. And uh, he's uh, his, the first thing he's done is he's bought a bank called Scotia Bank for, from memory, $35 million, US dollars, that is. So what's that? Uh, 20, 27, 28 million pounds. But he's doing that, in effect, for cash. And uh, therefore, I'm quite sure he has a scheme on here where he thinks he's going to do very well. 
But the overwhelming common sense attitude is that he's gone in at 38 pence a share, mega, at cash. You can't seriously imagine he's going in at 38 pence so he can sell at 45 pence. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense at all. Um, so the fact is that I think the shares in Caribbean will go far, far higher. I mean, it really will go higher. Um, I'm amazed that the shares are less than 50p at the moment. And I think there's a fair chance that uh, it can hit 100p, uh, if not necessarily later this year, say in the next 18 months. I think it's a cracking bet. And this one paid a very chunky dividend, didn't it, at the start of the I know. And there was talk at the time of, not, of that 5.3p dividend being supplanted by exactly the same in August of this year, i.e. that was described then as an interim dividend. Mm. Well, the broker at Sencos uh, wisely took the view that it would be as well to show in the dividend statement that uh, the, 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 another dividend to be paid, or dividends will be paid, subject to there being uh, cash in hand. Well, I think there is cash in hand, and I think there must be a chance that there will be a final dividend declared this year. That would be another 5.3p. You may say, do you mean that's 10.6p for the year? Well, yes, it would mean that, uh, but I can tell you that it's not a completely absurd idea because the business is making money hand over fist. We've got a question from Richard. Uh, what's your current view on Watchstone? Well, <coughs> as you know, I persisted with Watchstone and I always took the view that the litigation conceived by Slater and Gordon in Australia against Watchstone was simply frivolous drivel. Uh, so I didn't think that was any threat at all, really. And uh, the fact is that the, clearly the directors of Watchstone uh, were wise to defend. I'm sorry to say that they did have to bear their own legal expenses in dealing with these bloody lawyers in Australia. But the fact is that they did. And the fact is that um, they had one other arsehole of a lawyer to cope with, and uh, he's dropped out of it. Uh, I think they're called Harker's Pinker or something like that, or Pinker's Harker, I can't remember. Anyway, they would, were coming up um, with a plan whereby Watchstone pays this results remunerated lawyer according to the view that um, the, uh, the directors of Watchstone were party to pumping up the share price to the disadvantage of those appearing in the litigation group. Well, that strikes me as horseshit. And as a result, uh, that action, I think, falls away. It's just lawyers coming in for fees. It has nothing to do with truth or economic reality. Okay, um, interesting one from Andrew. Has the time finally come to successfully short Tesla? Well, <laughs> well I sold another hundred yesterday. <laughs> it's starting to get very expensive. It cost you quite a lot of money that one time. It certainly has. My current position is I'm short 300 at bloody hell. It's up at $1,420 as we speak. <laughs> it's absolutely amazing. I don't know. I think it's valued more than Toyota now, isn't it? No, oh, much more. Yeah. And it's, it's got nothing to do with economic reality. It is all to do with religion. The fact is that the religious adherence, or the, sorry, the adherence to the religion that is Musk, um, have uh, gone completely potty. And, of course, when people go potty, you don't know how long or how far they will choose to be potty. But they, they can't go on forever. So I think with a bit of luck, 
we'll get the money back and uh, all will be well. But I grant you, it's cost me a great deal of money. Uh, I should think it's cost me about £250,000 now, which is a lot of money. But anyway, there it is, it happens. Okay, there. well, uh, we're going to move on to some questions on um, how evil invests. So uh, the first one is from Chris, and that's, um, what are the immediate red, red flags that you look for in a company um, when eyeing up a short position? Well, uh, the, the obvious uh, answer to that is to find a stock that's materially overvalued. And my goodness me, we've had a terrific example in recent weeks with Boohoo. Uh, if I may deal with that uh, in two segments, uh, I, I do so as follows. Uh, the, the first compelling argument for selling Boohoo was that the Kamani family clearly take the view that they, they need some more remuneration. So they're taken, as you know, a remun director's remuneration, remuneration normally has to be settled by the remuneration committee and who are independent, as you said, of the directors. And then, then ultimately the shareholders can vote upon the conduct of the company come the next EGM or AGM. But uh, here, uh, the, the Kamanis have, uh, I don't like to use the term help themselves to several hundred million pounds, but that's a fair interpretation of the consequences of their acquisitions of Nasty Girl, Pretty Little Thing, and ISIF, which is, I saw it I saw it first. <laughs> anyway, uh, what amazed me was how uh, indifferent investors were to this sort of conduct. Of course, a lot of them are stuck in there because uh, they disobey Sir James Goldsmith, Sir James Goldsmith's first rule of investment, which is that he who invests to save tax will soon have no tax problems. <laughs> anyway, the fact is that um, the second, I mean, I remember when it was pointed out that the inheritance tax avenue was holding the share price up, I don't imagine any holders thought they were in any trouble. Well, I think they'll be thinking about that now. It's not so much the extraordinary conduct of the Kamani family, uh, as regards um, uh, related party transactions. It's the news that the margins at Boohoo are, are now clearly suspect. Uh, it's a, they were, from memory, about three or four percent on turnover, better than those achieved at ASOS and a German competitor whose name escapes me. And the fact is that Neither Assos nor this German competitor are stupidly run businesses. So somewhere, uh, Boohoo was getting it cheap. Well, we now know where it was. It was coming from Leicester, partially subsidized by uh, the British taxpayer. Uh, I'm sure they would uh, disagree with that interpretation. But I'm sure that is a sensible uh, review of the margins because um, what's been happening is that uh, Boohoo's suppliers have uh, been paying cash in hand to their workers uh, in Leicester and the advantage of cash in hand is they can do it at £3.50 an hour whereas the minimum rate in law is £8.72 an hour but if they were to have these workers formally on the books, then the fact is the £8.72 would be payable by law. And the fact is they can't afford that. So on top of that, they say to their workers uh, who are receiving cash in hand, they say, well, if you trot along to Social Security and get a top-up. So that takes them up towards £8.72 an hour and, and 
poor bastards, that's enough upon which they get by. However, this must come to an end. I may add, Boohoo uh, themselves are not engaged in illegality. Uh, I, I must say that's very important. But a number of suppliers to, to Boohoo, based in Leicester, clearly are in breach of the law. You may imagine that it would be simple for Boohoo to move their supply chain over to the Far East, but it, that there they lose the capacity to arrange long lines of uh, stock, which they know they can sell quickly. Uh, and it, it, once you go to, say, Bangladesh, uh, apart from quality control problems, the stock has got to be delivered here, and the cost of delivery is quite considerable. So as a result, I think Boohoo are going to take a real blow now to the cost of their supplies. However, I think one can go on and say that there must be a chance, as not yet shown, that the kiddies who get a, a Boohoo dress uh, and I'm not one of them, steady. But if uh, the, the kiddies who go and get these dresses, uh, they cost very little, say £10. They may say, well, I'm taking advantage of someone who's paid very little. And personally, I couldn't give a toot if I were a buyer of a dress. But a lot of the kiddies will mind, and it may be that sufficient of the kiddies uh, who buy from Boohoo, uh, who withdraw their custom altogether. That's a possibility, but we have to wait and see. There's no need to salivate yet. Any any sort of general sort of red flags, though, evil that you, you look at? Well, when you indeed, are... I, indeed yeah. I know people make a great point about red flags, but these things come up in their own way, in their own time. And I... I I don't think it's easy to categorize these things. I mean, it's one thing to say that the margins at Boohoo are, are large, but until it's explained just how they're large, it's, it's impossible to say, well, we've got to hammer the stock now on the basis that high margins may, on inquiry, be shown to reveal non-sustainable non behavior. So that's, one has to take um, each set of circumstances as they arise. I, I, as I say, I'm suspicious about looking for red flags. Okay. I mean, you do bear in mind that a stock with no asset cover to speak of is capitalized at five billion pounds or thereabouts. You might think that that's pretty suspicious, but until you see just why it's suspicious. You could be in trouble, Shorty. Question from Paul. Where does Evil receive or seek his information from? On which news channels, websites, podcasts um, does he trust and pay attention to? Um, I, I like to think, I may deceive myself, but I like to think that I can tell when something is redolent of truth. <laughs> and that's very important. Truth is uh, a variable feast, you know, but some statements uh, are much more probable than others. Uh, for instance, you know that radio program uh, which comes out uh, at midday on Sundays, The Unbelievable Truth? Well, I'm quite good at that. Uh, I, I, I can listen to a, a sentence or a paragraph, I think, is that probable? Is it possible? And that's the way I approach uh, the nature of truth. But once one, once one gets into the habit of, of picking apart the use of English, I think, that, I think one can be colossally re rewarded. Um, question from Kieran. When do you favour spread betting over, over other ways to invest, um, such as equities, for example? Well, the cost is so much lower. It's hugely lower. <laughs> uh, I mean, 
to give you an idea, I use an agency broker who are well respected uh, and they charge me 0.5%. Uh, that has been the case since uh, 30 years. And the fact is that that's what I want. And I want the uh, um, shares held in segregated accounts and I want so members of the family know where they are and it all has to be accounted for to the end of the revenue. Whereas with spread betting, where I've had certainly two insolvencies, in fact, it, I think it's three insolvencies, I can't remember now, but the fact is they're a damn nuisance when these insolvencies arise, and so I'm rather more cautious than I used to be. And, um, but spread betting is by far and away the cheapest vehicle for investment, that's for sure. And don't forget this, you don't have to spend time uh, writing out um, bargains for the purposes of tax records. That doesn't, have, does, that doesn't happen. And uh, whether the money I've saved thereby equals the money I've lost through insolvencies, I don't know. But the money I've lost through insolvencies is certainly the order of £200,000, which is a damn nuisance. And I, I should just mention, I did get some back from the financial compensation service schemes. It wasn't, it was gross 200000 and I should think that the net losses were something like 100000 But um, uh, if, if you were to see the vast files of paperwork generated by investment here, which my personal shopper has to sort out at the end of every tax year, uh, the, one would say that's really quite a, a blow to have to put up with. But we do, we have to put up with it and it does get put up with. Interesting one from Chris. What percentage of your short selling investments, if any, would you say result in failure? <laughs> oh, well, quite often. Uh, I've just been talking about Tesla. That one's, uh... Well, that's a very good example. <laughs> the, the fact is, Tesla's giving me grief. Now, I'll get it right in the end, but I may get murdered before, so I won't, I won't actually see the end. <clears throat> No, I, I, I'm afraid that happens in life. There's nothing one can do about it. And when just it, things go wrong. And the skill when they go wrong is to cut it. You do not have to uh, hold these positions forever. And you've just got to be a man and cut it. What are we talking about, though, even in terms of figures? Or would you say, what, 25%, 30%? No, I don't, I don't believe in these percentages. What I think is important is to be dispassionate. And you've got to ask yourself with a short position as to whether information will come out in due course which will justify your holding the position open. Now that's a matter of judgment. And I, I very much hesitate to be dogmatic as to when that position arises. So like I like can as, as like a change, change your opinion. <laughs> a bigger one? Like Keynes, the facts change, so you change your opinion. Yes, yeah, that is correct. Uh, you can't do it any other way. I mean, any other way is uneducated. The idea is to bring a formulaic response to investment circumstances, and there is no formula. You've got to think about each position separately as and when it arises. So a um, question from Sanjay, setting aside your, your trading and your spread betting activities, do you, um, do you invest or hold part of your portfolio for long-term growth? If so, which sectors or particular shares interest you? <laughs> well, uh, you're quite right that uh, I do invest long-term. For instance, I invest long-term for my wife, uh, I, to whom I have referred as the personal shopper. Uh, and my children. Now that makes sense. Uh, and um, invariably, I think one should go for investments which are palpably cheap and ignored by others. And uh, I mean, one I've got on the go at the moment is REA Holdings. 
world is taking an eternity to bottom out. But I still think the shares are very cheap. And what it also interests me is that nobody, and I've been literally nobody other than myself, follows them. So one day it's going to come right. For instance, I don't know why people can't understand this, but seemingly they can't. The preference shares of REA, which pay 9p or 9% at 100 pence, now stand at about 60p, where they're yielding, I don't know, 13%. And furthermore, on top of that 13%, there are arrears of dividends of 13 and a half pence per share. On top of which, there are 70 million prefs in issue as against 44 million of ordinary. And as a result of the dividend arrears, the, the preference shareholders have the whip hand as regards the refinancing of the company and so what the terms will be, provided they're fair to the ordinary shareholders, uh, uh, they, they will be able to control it. So it seems to me that the preference shares are a screaming buy. Okay. What about um, any, any funds or investment trusts, Evil? Do you hold any of those? Well, Again, because of the wretched financial services, or what do they call themselves, the, the, the authorities, it's very difficult to get any proper advice on an economic base, basis for investment trusts. Uh, I'm, what, uh, you see, for any broker, to, and it has to be a broker, because only a broker has regular business in investment trusts, for any broker to give advice to a punter on investment trust, he's got to be clear that the client, his client will not rat on him to the financial doodah authority. And of course, many brokers say, well, I can't be bothered with that. I'm just going to keep my mouth shut and get on with my few favored institutional clients. And the private clients don't get a look in, but, which is ridiculous. But that's what, that's the result that we have achieved through regulation. What we've achieved is failure, <laughs> complete failure. It's an astonishing achievement on the part of the authorities. I don't entirely blame these blithering idiots, but because they have to, to bend to Brussels, from whom I... I remind you, we've yet to get clear. And the fact is that these people are complete wastrels. They know nothing about anything. All they want to do is boss people around, pick up large salaries for wasting people's time. And I'm afraid we're stuck with that. And uh, since I don't equivocate when giving advice to the authorities, they just try to upset me, and they certainly have succeeded, and I've had to fight back. I think they're thieves, really. They just like to get lots of money for doing nothing other than wasting people's time. There you are. Okay. So that's your answer. Well, we've kind of done it already, but moving on to uh, miscellaneous questions. Um, Will all the government funds flowing into the economy make UK banks a good investment going forward? And that's uh, that's well, that's very lot. interesting. That that's a very interesting question. I, I, at long last, the banks are able to make some money, lending money, and that has not been the case for many years. The trouble is that at the very moment when they can lend some money at a profit. They have completely lost confidence in lending any money in the first place. So you get these completely mad loans at 39% per annum. They're all, play they're all charging 39%, which is a complete fiddle. That's obviously a cartel, which they've settled upon. Uh, but at least they are lending at 39% and making some money. Now, the question is, will there be a fairer deal in the future? And I think there will be. Remember, the supply of money to these banks is, is costing them nothing. 
It just goes straight from the Bank of England to them for nothing. And so there's no shortage of supply of money. Uh, and I think as soon as banks start to be run by people who are mildly sensible, then I think there will be an opportunity for banks to make a lot of money and uh, the terms of lending will be much more reasonable from the point of view of the borrower. Would you go out and buy, a, buy bank shares today, Evil? I mean, Jim's a well, fan of Lloyds, the, I think, wasn't it? A, as you know, the chairman is very, very sweet on Lloyds Bank. Uh, he has been for a very long time. Uh, and I don't know if he's right about that. Uh, I, I mean, I just don't buy shares in big companies. And of course, Lloyd's is a huge business now. Um, that said, I, I just there are other things that I'd much sooner buy than Lloyd's Bank. But I think the chairman's got a point. I think the day will come when Lloyd's will be seen to be cheap. And then people will say, well, why didn't I put Aunt Fanny's inheritance into Lloyd's Bank? Well, I can't help. But the funny thing about banks is they have long phases of um, being uh, trusted beyond belief. For instance, a cousin of mine who'd worked for Lloyd's Bank uh, for many years had a huge amount of money uh, in uh, Lloyd's Bank. And uh, I said, it'd be much wiser for you to sell out. I didn't know what the shares were at the time. Were they seven pounds or something? I didn't know, it was a lot of money. Uh, I said, much wiser to just come out of that uh, behemoth and go and buy Golden Prospect. And uh, her brother and another cousin of mine um, said, uh, oh, that silver tongue talk. I said, well, please yourself. But I, don't, I want to be realistic. Had that seven pounds been switched at the time I suggested, it would now be worth 70 or 140 pounds. <laughs> and whereas her seven pounds is now sunk to 29 pence. So it just shows people get into a habit with invest, in investment and they make mistakes. Um, question from Stuart, a bit more light-hearted this one. So apart from the excitement of betting on horses, eating and drinking, what yeah. else do you enjoy spending your cash on? Uh, well, I, <laughs> the truth of the matter is, as you've observed, I live rather frugally. But say I don't, I don't know, incidentally, much as I love boozing, my health simply does not permit it. I can't do it. Remember, a couple of years ago, I was losing the use of my legs through a condition called neuropathy. And that was a consequence of the diabetes, and the diabetes was a consequence of the booze. So the fact is that my days of heavy boozing, I'm afraid, are over for the rest of my life, which is a pity, because I love booze, and I got very, very nice wine stored here, I can tell you. But presumably the uh, horse racing's back on the cars now. Well, yes. Um, <laughs> amazingly, uh, I was told to back Serpentine in the Derby by a friend of mine who said it was really a 10 to 1 chance rather than a 25 to 1 chance. And like a complete fool, I said I need more evidence. But I, I had the evidence. It was very good evidence. And, if I had backed, if I got hold of that, I could have won well over a hundred thousand pounds, but I didn't do it. So there's my pleasure in horse racing, wondering about horses that I should have backed, but I haven't. But if, I, I'm showing a good profit this year, so I'm, it's all right. And maybe, uh, maybe a horse of your own's on the cards, uh, Simon. If uh, if the gold price keeps going up. <laughs> uh, in fact, well, that's possible. <laughs> yes, I uh, I've got. I've got my racing colours directly in front of me. Uh, that you can't see them, uh, they're up on the wall. But um, uh, uh, yes, I think I might buy a horse, but I'm going to have to be persuaded a bit that it's a good bargain. And uh, also that I've 
got bookmakers who take the bets. And there is a problem with bookmakers now that they're all regulated by the Gambling Commission. And as a result, that they can't take the bets they'd like to take and should take if the punter were to come on and have a go. So it, 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 it's a very hard business, I can tell you. Don't forget, say you buy a horse for 50,000 quid and accept that you're going to have to write it off over two years. That's a, a, a depreciation cost of 25,000 pounds. And trading fees are getting on for 25,000 pounds a year. So you've got to make 50,000 pounds a year just to cover the underlying cost of the horse. And it's very difficult to re reasonably to expect to make 50,000 pounds a year on a horse. I.e., you have 10,000 pounds on at 10 to one. Well, you, if it wins, well and good, that's 100,000 pounds in the tin. But if it loses, you, your bill's gone up from 50,000 for the year to 60,000 and you've nothing to show for it. I'm sure you can subsidize it with uh, your other endeavors, Simon. <laughs> I, cer I certainly hope so. I've, r I've conducted my entire life on that basis and have been fairly lucky. And uh, I'm now 73 <coughs> and I'm too old really to take massive risks. I'm not prepared to put 50,000 pounds on a football bet or a cricket team now. I just, I just haven't got the, I haven't, I've got the wherewithal, but I haven't got the urge, if you know what I mean. Okay, well, that concludes today's discussion. And don't forget, you can keep up to date with Evil's trading and investing activities at masterinvestor.co.uk. If you haven't already, um, don't forget to sub subscribe to the mailing list for updates on future webinars and all our other content. Thank you all for watching today and thank you, Simon, for being a great sport. Thank you, James. And I look forward to being invited to another webinar when it suits you. Good stuff. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.